water relations is what we'll be talking about in this lecture. I want you to be able to define <clears throat> water stress, evapotranspiration, and, a little more difficult, vapor pressure deficit. I want you to be able to list components of water stress. So, what is humidity? What is heat? And how do organisms take up and retain water? How do they get rid of water? How do they lose water? Not on purpose, and kind of the behavior and physiology of these organisms in your descriptions. Be able to, generally speaking, calculate water uptake and water loss. We're going to start this with the desert cicada. So the desert cicada should not exist. Basically, here we have an organism that in the middle of the hottest days in some of the hottest environments is able to sit on a tree and make a loud buzzing noise. Now, it, as it makes this buzzing noise, it's metabolically active. So it'll be generating heat. So this animal is out in the middle of the day generating more heat on an already hot day. So scientists look at this and said, well, this organism should not be able to sit in the sun making its own body heat at temperatures that would be definitely lethal to it. So how is this desert cicada able to keep buzzing when air temperatures are high enough to kill it? But it's still doing its thing. We're going to start this off water relations with relating heat to humidity. If you remember in the temperature lecture, I mentioned how temperature and water are intimately related. So you can't really think about one in ecology without thinking about the other. And that's because it's the interaction between organisms and their environment. And all terrestrial organisms are more water inside the organism than there is in the environment. We also know pretty well that warmer air can hold more water. So there's this relationship between what the air temperature is and what the water availability is, but there's also humidity. So I want you to think of it this way. At a, so relative humidity is, it's equal to the water vapor density divided by the saturation water vapor density times 100. That's how we calculate relative humidity. So if I say it's 20% relative humidity, what that means is the water vapor that's present is 20% of the water vapor that could be present. At 100 degrees Celsius, which is the boiling point for water, the saturation water vapor pressure, water vapor density, is air pressure. So the water will boil out continuously as you add, um, well, as you add energy, which is needed. But you think of it this way, too. At zero degrees, sorry, at, uh, yeah, at zero degrees Celsius, water would normally be freezing. Um, there is still some water that can be in the air, but water is probably leaving the air more than it's entering the air. So when the relative humidity hits 100%, water starts condensing. When the relative humidity is less than 100%, water is evaporating. And if we lower the temperature, we can only really lower it to the condensation point of water. Because once we hit that condensation point of water, the water will condense. And as it condenses, it gives off energy, which continues to warm the air. So it's cooling down till water starts condensing. And then it starts warming up again as water condenses and loses heat to the air. In the same way, as you warm things up, it'll take more water away, but that takes a lot more heat to warm up an area with more water because it's going into the air. And as it evaporates, it takes energy to evaporate. So this is one of the reasons that we see changes in air temperature depend largely on the relative humidity that we have. So it's also why if it's very humid outside, then you're not able to sweat as much because water vapor doesn't want to go into the air. It wants to well, stay on your body because a higher water vapor density compared to the saturation water vapor density means that you can't lose heat by losing water because you can't lose water. Water doesn't want to leave. 
I think of it this way too. A wet towel given a so a wet towel given a standardized humidity as it warms up will lose more. So 50% humidity, the air can hold more water at a higher temperature. Okay. Humidity and dew point. So <clears throat> it's kind of mentioning how dew point is when water leaves the air. So if we're 30 degrees out, it's a pretty hot day, about 85, 86 uh, Fahrenheit, and 50% humidity, how much can it cool down before dew starts to form? It's where we can see what is the 100% humidity, that's the dew point, and what is your actual relative humidity? So you look at this chart and you'll see at 30 degrees, where 30 degrees intersects with um, what is it, the water in the air, the 50% vapor pressure, um, pretty much right above the 30. You can see it will calm, it'll cool down to about 21, 22 degrees before water starts leaving the air and forming dew. A lower humidity means there's a higher change in the temperature before the dew point. So today, for example, it's 20% humidity, 25% uh, humidity where I am teaching this. Well, not this room, but it's 20% humidity outside, which means it's very hot. It can cool down a long ways before we hit a dew point. And yeah, lower humidity means more water can just kind of go out into the air. So if I were to take a wet towel and put it outside right now, it'll dry off very quickly. So that's good because you can get a lot more water into the air. If I were to take a wet towel and leave it in my downstairs bathroom during the winter, my downstairs bathroom will be about 15 degrees Celsius and 90% humidity. I could leave my wet towel downstairs in there and it'll stay wet till I need to use a towel again. That's disgusting, but that's humidity. If I were to leave it outside today, it'll be dry in 10 minutes. So we're talking about the ability of air to just remove water and how much the air temperature changes based on how much water there is. These are two things that will kind of inform what organisms can live somewhere and what adaptations they will need. That's your ecology. So vapor pressure deficit. It's your saturation water, saturation water vapor pressure, water vapor pressure divided by, oh sorry, minus actual vapor pressure. Is vapor pressure deficit. So how much water could be in the air versus how much water is in the air. So how much water could be minus how much water is, is giving you the deficit that you have. A very hot place with very low water vapor pressure, you can think of it this way, it's got a high vapor pressure deficit in that very hot place with very low, pre pre yeah, with very low vapor pressure. So it's going to suck the moisture out of organisms. Think of Washington State during the summer. It's really dry here during the summer. And I have a, a big stack of wood in my backyard that needs to dry out during the summer. Since it's got such a large vapor pressure deficit here during the summer, it only takes three months for the wood to dry. If I were living in upstate New York, however, where humidity of 50 to 70 percent is normal during the summer, then what's going to happen is it's going to take about two years, two summers, for that to actually dry out. So activities like panting or sweating are very effective when you have a high vapor pressure deficit because that water is leaving more quickly. A wet towel put on a dog during a hot, dry day is going to cool the dog a lot more than a wet towel put on a dog during a uh, hot, humid day. There is a relationship between water vapor pressure deficit and elevation as well. And I want you to kind of think of this one on your own. Let's say you were to go higher up in the elevation. What's going to happen 
to the vapor pressure deficit. So if you think about it, high elevations, is water boiling at a lower temperature or a higher temperature? And what does that tell you about the saturation water vapor potential? And why does water boil at a higher temperature or a lower temperature? Why don't you look that up, think it through, come back with some answers. Meanwhile, water in aquatic environments. Well, it's everywhere, right? Ah, not quite. Water in aquatic environments is the inverse of how salt it is in the aquatic environment. Remember osmosis. Every salt ion is interacting with water ions, and that takes down the free energy of water. Decreasing the free energy of water makes it less available to those organisms that live in it. And aquatic organisms can actually be isoosmotic, where they have the same water potential as, uh, as the water itself. They can be hyperosmotic, where they have a higher water potential, or hypoosmotic, where they have a lower water potential. So if you think about a saltwater fish, they're constantly taking up salt, and they're trying to get rid of excess salt. Water leaves their body just through osmosis alone, so they're constantly drinking more water. Whereas a freshwater fish is taking up water even though it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't have to drink, it just takes up water, but it loses salts. It needs to gain salts in its food. So a freshwater fish will want to take in salts and will not want to take in water. So when people say, I drink like a fish, and they've got this picture of a, a bass with some wine, well, a bass is a freshwater fish. So freshwater fish don't drink. They're teetotalers. They just take up water naturally from their environments. Whereas if I were to say, I drink like a fish, and I mean a nice saltwater fish, or a briny lake fish, well, then you probably you might have a problem. All right, water uptake and water loss. Let's get into the quote-unquote math. All right, this is easy. It's just a bunch of letters. What A, so equals WD plus uh, WF minus, nope, 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 plus WA, A, A minus WO minus WIS. Water, this is your internal water, so how much water does the organism have? How much does it get from D? Drinking. F, food. A, absorbed from air. That can happen. E, E, evaporated, and S, secreted. Think of uh, kidneys, think of um, skin. So, yeah. You're not going to ever do the actual math from this. This is just a conceptual thing. So the water in an organism, it gets from drinking food and absorption. It loses through evaporation and secretion. It's kind of like that heat thing. You got the radiation, you got the conduction, you got the convection, you got the evaporation of heat. So these things, general ideas, not so much a specific math. And if you're thinking about plants, you replace uh, drinking food with roots. And instead of evaporation, just say transpiration, which is evaporation, but a fancier term. It's called evapotranspiration. The water lost to the air. Evapotranspiration is how much water is being lost as the cost of doing photosynthesis. And you have larger leaves, you can do more photosynthesis. Look at that zucchini plant, huge. It can do a lot of photosynthesis because it has a large leaf area. There are no weeds near that, photos near that zucchini plant, it just shades them out. But larger leaves take more water pressure to actually um, hold the leaves up. They take more water to actually keep the leaves uh, metabolically alive. And they take more water because 
as the leaves heat up, they need to cool down to a temperature where Rubisco can actually do its job. Rubisco carboxylase activity decreases after 30 degrees Celsius, but Rubisco oxygenase activity increases after 30 degrees Celsius. So the hotter temperatures means loss of carbon. So those leaves, which are great for shading out your opponents, become a liability when you have to fill them in water and when you have to cool them with water. So it's a water cooling system, like some cars who don't have enough, uh, what is it, um, antifreeze. It's a water cooling system. So water loss can cool the leaves, but the bigger the leaf, the more water it will take. So you're probably not going to see large zucchini plants in places where it's very dry, unless they have somebody who's watering them every day. So plant water pressure can be measured, the water pressure is measured using the equation psi w, which is water potential, equals water of pressure minus water solutes. You may see a plus there sometimes, but solute potential is always negative, so it's going to be a negative anyway. Plants can change their solute potential. So remember, solute potential, if you may remember from osmosis, solute potential is how much salts they have in the water. And more salts means what less free energy of water, so lower water potential. More water pressure increases the free energy of water, the ability of water to do work, so it increases water potential. So plants can, um, they can increase the, or decrease the amount of solutes to take water out of the soil. So if you keep them in moist soil, though, you keep a low solute potential, which allows them to easily have a high water potential for a relatively low pressure. And do remember, plants can often tolerate several water pressure levels. So they don't need to maintain homeostasis within a very narrow band. They can maintain homeostasis within a relatively larger band. So this picture of a leaf here is actually rolled up like that. What it's doing is it's avoiding the loss of more water by keeping all of its stomata in kind of a, this curved C. All the stomata are in the inside where there will be a higher vapor pressure of water inside that coiled area than outside that coiled area. Thus, those stomata will not suffer as much of a vapor pressure deficit when they're all curled up like that, and the plant will not lose as much water. So the plant water pressure can be maintained through physiological adaptations like that, and that allows them to tolerate several water pressure levels. Sometimes these leaves don't roll up until it's already very dry out. And they may, they're still alive, even though they've lost a lot of water. Whereas you, you can't lose too much water before you did. So here's just a kind of a big picture of the cohesion tension model, how plants move water. So there is a higher water potential in the soil than there is in the outside air. So the air has a vapor pressure deficit compared to the soil. So the soil would normally evaporate to the air, but if we're talking soil that's not in contact with the air, it can't evaporate water from that deep soil to that air. A tree that is in that space uses the vapor pressure deficit to move water from deep soil to the top of a tree. So the vapor pressure deficit is pulling the, the water from the soil to the air through the tree. And it does so based on the properties of water vis-a-vis -vis hydrogen bonding, the cohesion tension theory. The basic idea that when water has a um, kind of a very stable film, a minimum surface area film, there will be less water molecules being lost from it. But as more water molecules are lost, it actually starts uh, increasing the surface area, more water molecules get pulled, and the water wants to maintain that surface area, that less surface area. So it'll pull water from the nearby cells, which will be contiguous with the xylem, which is contiguous with the trunk, all the way down to the roots, forming a single column of water molecules from the stoma all the way down to the water uptake in the soil. And that means a vapor pressure deficit at the top of a tree is pulling water 
all the way from the bottom of the soil through a differential of water potentials through that whole tree. It's a large gradient. This allows the passive movement of water through a tree. Cool. And I do mean cool because it also cools off the tree. But this is how trees and other plants can often live in places with a high vapor pressure deficit, provided the simple adaptation of roots. They stay cooler and they stay with a greater amount of water because they're using the vapor pressure deficit to drive their water uptake. Humidity is a problem though. Very low humidity can remove water faster than the plant can replace it from the soil. So a longer time when there's less water in the soil means more stress on the plant. That's just basic gardening there. <laughs> Very high humidity decreases evaporation. So now the plant is not losing water. It means the plant can't draw up water. It decreases water stress, but decreases the ability of the plant to cool itself down. So high temperatures, high humidity, hot plants. Now, plants have dozens of adaptations to get around some of these problems. We'll cover a few a little later. What about animals? So, what about in general? How do you get water? What are some adaptations to take it up? Well, drinking, of course. So there's drinking. Metabolism provides water. If you burn fats, you, you lose carbon dioxide and it converts the H's in the fats to H2O. So metabolism can produce water. This kangaroo rat right here is capable of taking in the seeds. The seeds have lots of fat. The kangaroo rat converts, reacts those fats with aerial oxygen to make CO2 and H2O. That rat just drank when it ate. Roots acquire water, then do that. Mist drinking. This can mean sticking up body parts that will get condensation from the mist and then drinking from them. Some beetles have that adaptation. It's kind of, kind of nifty to watch. Having aerial roots. There can be roots put out into the air so that when mist blows over them, it condenses on the roots and they can just drink the water straight from there. So that's the, um, the water uptake from the air. Most animals lose water through evaporation, just by their surface area, and through regulations and secretions. So lizards will reduce evaporation through their scaly skin. Mammals will reduce evaporation through their hair. Birds will reduce evaporation through feathers. Um, mammals will reduce secretion by their kidneys. Lizards and birds will reduce secretion by utilizing uric acid as their secretory uh, nitrogenous waste. So there are all these adaptations, and the kidney is really a fun one to go into because that's how uh, mammals are going to reduce the loss of, uh, of water. I mean, birds and lizards also have kidneys, but our, our, I like ours better. They're, they're cool. We don't use uric acid, we use urea. Plants have a necessary cost to um, photosynthesis, and their necessary cost is water loss. So when animals have too much water, they can just urinate more. Turns out when plants have too much water, some, but not all of them, can sweat out the water through specialized pores. Some, but not all. Some, some drown. You can drown a plant. I, I did over the winter. I, I drowned a plant. It was, it was sad. All right, water conservation. So let's look at some adaptations here. So... Plants, they have a cuticle, waxy covering. They can simply close their stomata. They can wilt or roll their leaves to reduce the surface area or expose a lighter skin surface. They can flag their leaves, which means droop them, or they can lose their leaf through senescence, occasionally up to the total leaf loss. For some more direct ones, let's go to the garden. It's a hot, sunny day. Temperature here says about 90 degrees in the shade. To make matters worse, very dry. I have a little uh, humidity meter and it says it is about 25% humidity. It's very windy and this is full sunlight exposure for about 10 hours. 
these plants right here have different adaptations for dealing with this type of stress. Right here, I never quite figured out what type of flower this is, but the dark green surface is what's exposed when it's not very dry. When it starts to get dry, it wilts and turns up this light green bottom. So these plants will actually wilt and roll their leaves. As they roll their leaves, they expose more light parts of there, and that will reflect the light better and reflect the heat better. We also have some heather right here. Heather leaves are kind of rolled around, and as they're rolled around, they uh, they decrease the amount of wind of water loss whenever this wind blows over by, by maintaining a certain boundary layer within that rolled up leaf. They also have sunken stomata, which in the same way have a boundary layer. But a great adaptation here is with these uh, these crassula. These thick, succulent leaves, their stomata are closed all day. There is no water loss during the day through the stomata because they manage to keep them closed. They'll open them at night when the relative humidity goes up as the temperature goes down. That's when they can lose water, but that's also when they take in carbon dioxide. It's the equivalent of holding your breath all day so you don't lose water through your mouth. Highly functional and really effective. These plants will grow much quicker now that it's warm and hot out and warm and dry out than most of the other plants. They've actually started to take over my garden here in the summer. As far as the animal side of things, we've got this, uh, my son found this little uh, beetle here. They've got a thick cuticle and their exoskeleton. You can also see they're somewhat reflective. I don't know how well that shows up, but they reflect the light a little bit. And behavior-wise, they'll hide themselves underneath plant matter to avoid the direct desiccating effects of the wind and the sun. Now that that one's dead, so all I really did was give it a burial. But here in the garden, we can see several different adaptations to dealing with uh, water stresses, whether it be the light side of the leaves, rolled up leaves with sunken stomata, or just closing your stomata all day. There are different adaptations and answers to water stress. Animals, on the other hand, can waterproof and they can have uh, cuticles, very much like that beetle had a cuticle. The physiology of the uh, kidney and the secretion of various hormones can serve to, um, to aid in water retention. Having drier feces can serve as water retention to a point where the animal has some problems um, releasing the feces. I don't know if you've seen the movie Constipation. Oh, it hasn't come out yet. Uh, animals can also face the sun or find shade to reduce the amount of water loss. There's also cryptobiosis, where an animal shrivels up and just waits for the uh, just add water. So these are some different adaptations that animals and plants can have to conserve their water, even when higher temperatures require them to lose a lot of water. Which brings us back to this guy. Turns out, if you put this cicada in an environment with 100% humidity, it dies. So if you have it in a place with a high, va high water vapor pressure deficit, it's fine. It can buzz at temperatures where it would be lethal. And what it's doing is it's taking water from the tree. Essentially, remember how I said the tree cools itself by serving as a as conduit from the soil to the air. Turns out the cicada is tapping in and becoming part of that conduit. I'd say becoming one with the tree, but it's not. It's parasitizing the tree. It's sucking water out of the tree so it can cool itself. The evaporation prevents overheating because it can lose the water from water to water vapor. And as water converts from liquid water in the cicada to water vapor outside of the cicada, it will release a certain amount of heat. So by tapping into the tree and being part of that tree transpiration, it prevents overheating. And that's why a desert cicada can buzz even when the temperature would be leaking.